coming for dinner last night. It's um, a real privilege to be here and get to meet you in person. I too want to thank to my mom for all of her hard work in preparing this day and communicating with me back and forth. And it's a delight. But before I get started, I would like to introduce our president, Ken Riles of KB Ideas Center. Less than a year ago, but we are excited about the direction he's helping us go into for the future. So I've asked him just to give a few words of reading. Good morning. Thank you very much for having us. Um, as Shelley said, I'm Ken Riles. I'm here really for two reasons. I've been at the Idea Center for less than a year. Um, so the first, probably primarily most important reason, is I just want to get out and I think it's important that I meet the, the clients and uh, know what Shelley knows in terms of the relationship between our center and you. And as you probably know, we're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is teaching and learning support for higher ed. So I, I think it's really important that I get out and I kind of live the mission and learn what you're saying and what you need from us for teaching and learning support. So that's probably the most uh, compelling reason why I'm here. But I'm also here because of the same reason why you're here. And that's not the food. It's the uh, <laughs> fact that Shelley knows a lot more than I know. Uh, about uh, the uh, services that we provide through IDEA. And I'm actually here to learn, just like you are, and, and try and absorb as much information from Shelley as I can. So I'm kind of a student student as well. So thank you so much for your hospitality. We had a nice dinner last night, and um, I love meeting everybody. So I'm just thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Ken. So I just turned the mic on. Is it too loud, or how do we adjust that? Now? Okay, good. Okay. Well, let's get started then. Um, let me just tell you a little bit how this day is going to go or how we plan it to go. I'm very flexible. I like to say that I, I taught seven years in elementary school, so I go with flow. Um, but here's what we were thinking. Uh, the first session is going to be sort of general, the orientation to the idea system, the story behind it. I think it has a, a valuable story to be told. The philosophy of the instrument, how it works, how it customizes to your particular needs, how it fits into a learning center university such as yours. And uh, a little bit of specifics about the faculty information form and how to interpret the reports. There will be plenty of time for you to ask some questions at the end of the slides. But I want you to feel comfortable to say, hey Shelley, what about this or that as we're going along with something pops in your head and you don't want to make the end, that's fine too. So that's how the first session will go. After that, we're going to drill down because one of the tremendous benefits of IDEA is you can use it for more than student ratings and instruction. And that's, that's the term we typically use, student ratings and instruction. We feel like, as Dr. Turner said, students are not evaluating you. Uh, they're giving you a rating on their learning experience. And so that's the term we like to use, student ratings and instruction. And uh, we also know that uh, you can use these data for multiple purposes. And so that's the the reason why there are different types of workshops throughout the day. So there will be one on how to use it for faculty evaluation, emotion tenure, choosing one adjunct over another, and so on and so forth. There will be one for how to use aggregate data for assessment purposes, program review, curriculum review, and those kinds of things. And then there will be one on how to use aggregate data for faculty development, planning, resource allocations, how to help faculty with individual cases as well as groups of faculty. So those are the different ways we're going to look at it. We're going to get a general view of idea first, and then we'll put on different lenses as we go throughout the day. Also, after the first session, in the subsequent uh, three sessions, there will be opportunity for hands-on practice. So we won't have that in the first session, but once we get into it, you will be able to spend some time at the end of those uh, sessions for you to get into some small groups. I've got some sample. Uh, reports for you to look at. Hopefully you've brought uh, some of the reports. I think Tian Han has given you some of uh, your department reports as well. So, without any uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I think I've gone through this, what we're going to do today. Um, the first question I usually get is, what does IDEA stand for? And I think it's an important question. It stands for Individual Development and Educational Assessment. I'm going to have to kind of pause right there on the first two words because it is really the hallmark of what we're about. It's development. And uh, we use the data that we are able to help you um, receive 
to generate suggested action steps for improvement. So it's based on data that you can get suggestions to help you improve. But once you begin to collect those data on the individual uh, course level, as I said earlier, you can aggregate those data and get different kinds of reports and use those reports for different purposes. So there's a lot of value there. Sometimes stuff you think, well, I don't need to survey this course. I've taught it before. I know what's going to go on and so on and so forth. That may be true. It may also be true that the program needs that data or those data to be part of um, the aggregate for reports. So we're going to look at all of this today. Well, how did IDEA get started? It started back in the late 60s. I really, really love this story. It came out of the student protest movement at Kansas State University, Manhattan, Kansas, that's where the IDEA Center is today. And students were rising up on the campus there saying, we want to have a voice in uh, the type of teaching effectiveness we are experiencing. We want to have a voice in our learning experiences. At the same time, it's kind of a confluence of, of uh, events, a man by the name of Don Hoyt, and I'd like to mention his name when I do Canvas with this because he was the mastermind behind the, the uh, science of survey design, and he was, had just left ACT, the testing organization, and gone to Kansas State to work in the assessment. So Don did something that I think was brilliant. He went to faculty who had won teaching awards, and he invited them to work with him to create an instrument. I think the faculty also did something that was brilliant. They said, okay, Don, we'll work with you based on two conditions. And those conditions are true even today. They're very important. One, that the instrument focused on student learning. And two, that it provide feedback for faculty to make improvement methods. So that's the hallmarks of the instrument. No other uh, body was doing that at the time. And uh, I'd like to say they were probably, I don't know, two or three decades ahead of their time. And those of you who have been following the assessment movement came up through K-12 first. Uh, I do remember when Barr and Tag's article was published in Change Magazine in 1996 on the cover November, uh, December issue, you might remember it too, called From Teaching to Learning. And it was sort of the um, a signal moment that the paradigm began to shift, shift. And it was like a big shift moving, it's slow. But you Google that article today and it'll pop right up. It was, it was a uh, seminal moment in the assessment movement. But way back in the late 60s, early 70s, Don Hoyt and a group of faculty were saying, hey, let's ask the students to rate their learning. They were focusing on learning. Well, in 1975, they won a very generous grant of three quarters of a million dollars to the Kellogg Foundation that allowed them to disseminate this instrument across the nation. And uh, in 2001, they separated from uh, Kansas State University and became a standalone entity, a nonprofit organization. And we're not profit driven, we're mission driven. And here's our mission we're here to help you. We're here to help colleges and universities to improve teaching, learning, and leadership. And that's what we're all about. And quite frankly, that's why I went to the IT Center. If it had been a for profit company, and you know, I, I don't see myself as a vendor. I see myself as an academic like you and as a consultant. And about the philosophy of the system. So one of the first questions we think about when we think about student ratings and instruction is, well, what is teaching effectiveness? What I mean by teaching effectiveness might be something different from what you mean. And there's no one answer of what is teaching effectiveness. It's kind of like um, love, you know, there's different kinds of love, different, different types of relationships and so forth. And, um, I've been in meetings before where people will be talking about teaching effectiveness and I can tell they have a different, uh, they don't have shared definitions. So uh, what do you think about when you think of teaching effectiveness? Do you think of being clear, being organized, being prompt, introducing stimulating ideas, inspiring students, getting them to work in teams, requiring critical thinking, all of those things are important. Uh, and I think what we can say here is that most surveys will ask students to rate how well you do those things and then compare that to a model of how well you should have done those things. But idea does something a little different. It asks a different question. 
it asks how well do students rate their progress on the types of learning the instructor targeted. So it, it's a different question. I remember when I was at Johns Hopkins, and, and I said to a group of faculty one time, don't ask yourself how well did you teach, ask yourself how well did your students learn. And the faculty member uh, came up from that group and said, that has just completely changed how I think about curriculum design and what I do in the classroom. And in, in a way, that's the shift. Any, any student ratings instrument, course evaluation tool that you can think of, that I can think of at least, will do what's on the left here. How well did you do these things? And then it will compare it to some arbitrary model, and it may be appropriate in some ways. I'm not, not trying to disparage it completely. I'm just trying to make a, a distinction here of what the primary focus is of idea. Now, you'll notice that the idea instrument does have items about methods, and that's because we use those for formative feedback. And I'll show you how that works as we go. So, the philosophy of idea is that the primary indicant of teaching effectiveness, not the only one, but the primary indicant, is facilitating learning. So what makes idea unique? First of all, that, the fact that we focus on learning. But because we focus on learning, we also need to focus on the instructor's purpose. Because every course is different. Every discipline is different. Sometimes the sections within a course can be different. And so we need to find out from you, what is your targeted learning for that class? And that's what makes it so special. And quite frankly, that's why the faculty of Johns Hopkins brought idea to their campus because they wanted to have a voice in the process. It elevates the role of the faculty by allowing you to participate in that process. So, focusing on the instructor's purpose. We also provide adjustments. You've seen those adjustment scores. And that's because we know, we're social scientists, we know that there are variables outside your control that are going to have an impact on how students rate their learning. We're going to go into that in detail throughout the day, but basically motivation, work habits, class size, we can tell you right now that those are potent predictors of how students are likely to rate their learning. And so we provide you with not only your raw scores, but adjustments based on those variables. To our knowledge, the idea instrument is probably the most researched instrument that's nationally available today. And one thing I'm proud about is our research and development team. Very strong. And we make all of our data open to the public. You know, we're a nonprofit. We've got, I, I'm going to say competitors in quotes because they are typical, you know, vendors kind of business, for-profit businesses that have products that they sell for course evaluations, and they keep everything secret. We have webinars, but they won't let me sit in on it, and things like that. You know, well, we're not like that. We, we post everything on our researching papers on our website. If you're a statistician, we welcome you to download Technical Report 12, which will explain all of the technical aspects of the instrument. And uh, if you've got specific questions, we have people in our R&D team who are, would be happy to uh, chat with you and share with you some of the research behind the instrument. So we're very proud about that. Also, since it's a standardized instrument, we can provide you with comparisons. Those comparisons can be to our whole idea database. They can be to your institution, you establish your institutional ones. They can be to your discipline. And then you can actually order benchmarking reports where you can benchmark to your six to ten of your peers and you can select and you can see your peers in aggregate form. Um, your Carnegie classification group and so on and so forth. So because it's a standardized instrument, we can provide it <coughs> with comparisons. And finally, it's flexible. It's flexible because uh, you can add up to 20 items. And those items can be institution-based. You can begin to ask items that pertain to your QEP, for instance, if you needed to. Uh, you could uh, ask items that are related to particular accreditation requirements. For instance, I know of um, the School of Education at Loyola of Chicago. They've got three questions they ask pertaining to their conceptual framework for NK, if you're all if you're on your education. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. And so they ask those three questions every time, add it on. And that's giving them helpful data for their application process. So you can add items. Those items can be open-ended, or they can be on a limited scale. So whatever is going to work for you. And then, of course, it's flexible because you can use the data for so many things. Well, we like to say that there are some conditions that should be in place for the good use of the instrument. You can have a really good instrument, 
uh, if it's not being used in the right context, you'll have some problems. So what is the right uh, context? First of all, the target learning, we already talked about that. That it provide action steps, suggestions for you to think about that it have evidence for validity. Also, and I'll talk a little more about some of those uh, demonstrations of validity in the next session. Uh, the faculty should trust the process. If the faculty don't trust the process, we're going to have some, some concerns here. Uh, we're working with a, a brand new school called up. They haven't adopted that idea yet. They were thinking about it. And the first question they asked was, how will this be used against the faculty? <laughs> well, they weren't quite ready for it. <laughs> understanding that this is not a hammer to hit faculty over the head with. It's a tool to help them cultivate good practice. And so faculty should trust the process. They should value student feedback. You know, there's some, some faculty out there in the world, I don't know where, but there are some that really don't want to know what students think. Um, so the best use of ideas is one in which faculty do care and do value what students think about their own experiences. And then they should be motivated to uh, make improvement efforts. We like to say at the Idea Center that um, uh, student raise and instruction are often overemphasized and underutilized. Overemphasized when they count too much and major decisions about a person's life are made based on numbers. They're underutilized when they're not used to cultivate better practice to um, try out new things, to help faculty become reflective in their practice of teaching. And so, what is the appropriate weighting and use of these reports? Well, this is what our recommendation is. Let it be no more than 30 to 50 percent of one's teaching component of one's portfolio. So, you know, there's usually research, service, teaching, typically. And we're saying 30 to 50 percent of the teaching component. No more than that. And there will be other things that we believe should be taken into consideration. And I'm going to talk about that in the next session when we talk about situating this in a faculty evaluation system. Collect six to eight of your classes so that you're looking for trends. And if those class sizes are small, like fewer than 10, collect 12 and discard some outliers. You're going to get a good representation. And look for um, trends. Don't, don't over-interpret these based on a tenth of a point. Keep in mind that the standard error of measurement is plus or minus 0.3 on the five point scale. So those are some things you want to keep in mind in terms of the good uh, conditions for the good use of the instrument. Another aspect to the good use is something I've already uh, alluded to, and that is helping our faculty to become reflective. You know, when I was at Johns Hopkins and I worked with faculty who used IDEA, I, I had some faculty who were world renowned. I mean, they were just, uh, we, were, we were very privileged to have them. A lot of them were adjuncts, and they had jobs in Washington, D.C., or what have you, and they'd come in at night and teach for three hours or whatever, and so on. So, well, they used OBM. Yeah. And um, what really excited me, you know, really, really excited me, wasn't the number that appeared on the report. It was when they picked it up and they engaged in this reflection. And they said, basically, how did I do? How did the students do? What might I do next time to help them do that? To me, that's the sign of a great teacher, not just achieving a certain number. So uh, this is the model that we think of. First, you're going to collect your feedback. Then you're going to look at the reports and ask, what do the data say? What do they mean? What do they mean to me? And then you'll get some resources to help you put into action some of those suggested action steps talk with one another about it, and we'll elaborate on these steps more when we get to the faculty development session, which is at the end of the day. But for now, let me just situate this model here and say it's important that we help our faculty understand that this, this is one of the main goals here, is that we become reflective in our practice. So, the underlying philosophy of IDEA is that teaching effectiveness is determined primarily by students' progress and the types of learning the instructor targets. And what you'll notice, these are the paper versions, just so you can see it up close here. Um, the 12 learning objectives that are on the faculty information form are also on the diagnostic form. They are the same items, the same wording, 
And sometimes people don't know that. So I like to point that out to them. And that that's why, um, why we have it that way, because it's based on this underlying philosophy that the primary way to measure teaching effectiveness is through how well students rate their learning. So here's the faculty information form on the left is a paper, on the right is what you usually see in the idea online environment. Well, this is the most important part of the uh, faculty information form. It's the 12 learning objectives. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about this because it's very important. Those 12 learning objectives encompass six broad areas. They are basic cognitive background, application of learning, intellectual development, expressiveness, team skills, and lifelong learning. Those are broad uh, types of learning. Uh, and um, it is based on the student learning model here that specific teaching behaviors are associated with certain types of student progress under certain circumstances. So if you look at the instrument, and I'm going to ask you, maybe you can go ahead and pull out the maroon uh, form. Or, uh, yeah, pull out the maroon form. Behind tab two, you'll see a maroon form that says, uh, survey forms, student reactions, and instruction, and courses. This is the diagnostic form. This is what the paper form looks like. Um, so you can hold it in your hand while we talk about it. Teaching behaviors are associated with certain types of student progress under certain circumstances. So what I'm going to show you on the screen is how that falls out into the items. So the first 20 items of the maroon form, the student diagnostic form, are the teaching behaviors the teaching methods that the Idea Center uses for analysis. The next 12 are those 12 learning objectives that you see on the faculty information form. Okay. Then there are contextual variables, which are very important to take into consideration, many of which we use to provide you with adjustments to your scores. Then there are uh, summary items. There are three of them. Overall, I rate this course is excellent. Overall, I rate this teacher is excellent. As a result of taking this course, I have more positive feelings towards this field of study, which is really good, by the way, for those of you in um, education for demonstrating this position. Uh, and then you can add up to 20 things. So that's, that's how that falls out. Now I'm going to talk about the short form. So I don't think you used a short form here, but you might want to look behind tab three and pull it out. I'm going to show you what it looks like, what it's for. I, I do it. Then get some questions about what is the short form? Well, the diagnostic form, we don't call it the long form, because we don't want students to be we're doing the long form. <laughs> we call it the diagnostic form. The diagnostic form provides you with both summative and formative feedback. The short form only gives you summative feedback. Let me tell you why it is developed. Short form could be very useful for you in settings where the teaching modality does not change. There's not a teacher up in front of the classroom, such as student teaching, nursing clinicals, business internships, private music lessons, practica, and so on and so forth. Where you're not wondering about what types of methods you're going to be doing in the classroom. Instead, you want to know how well are students reading their progress on the types of learning that those uh, course experiences are targeting. So that's the purpose behind the short form. You can use both. You don't have to use one or the other for a given course. But you can use both within a university, within a program. And you can include both in your uh, group summary reports. You'll see later today when we talk about aggregate data how it will delineate how many diagnostic forms and how many short forms. Let me just add a little caveat to it though. You won't receive any data on teaching methodology. So that's why I'm suggesting it's a great fit for those learning experiences where you really don't need to know about teaching methodology. Uh, and it might be useful for you for those settings. So on the short form, there are no teaching so here's how the faculty information form looks to you in your online environment. Let's, let's spend a few minutes uh, talking about it. If you want to see that, it's behind tab one and it's green. It looks like this. This is the paper version of it. We're in forest green, they call it. The printing company called the forest green. Uh, 
Um, this is one of the most important parts of the IBS system. And it allows you to participate in the process. We like to recommend that no more than three to five objectives typically be selected. And I do know that the overall average here in Jacksonville State is higher. So this, this may be uh, something new. So let's, let's take our time to think about this. What we've done is we've provided you with three questions to serve as sort of a guide, a rule of thumb, a heuristic, whatever you want to call it, to help you and your faculty make decisions about whether or not a certain objective should be selected as important or essential. And so I'm going to walk you through these questions, and then I'm going to tell you a little story to help you uh, picture how this could work with you and with your own courses and with your faculty. So the first question is, is it a significant part of the course? So for instance, if I am focusing on objective number one, gaining factual knowledge, and I'm going to ask myself, shall we, is gaining factual knowledge a significant part of my course? And I might say, well, yeah, yeah, it is. Second question. Do I do something specific to help my students gain factual knowledge? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. Third question: Does the student's progress on gaining factual knowledge affect his or her grade? Oh, yes, it does. Okay. Now I've answered yes to all three of those questions. Therefore, I should be selecting objective number one, gaining factual knowledge, as important or essential. So. Let me tell you a story about Amanda. And I like to tell the story when I go on campus visits because sometimes I go back to my office in Kansas and I get an email from somebody that says, I love the story about Amanda. <laughs> um, it just sort of brings it to life. Amanda was my student at Johns Hopkins University. She was a PhD student in the School of Medicine uh, working on biology. But she wanted to be a professor. She didn't want to go into research. She wanted to be a professor. So she came over to the School of Education where I was teaching and took courses in teaching in higher education. So she's in my class, and, and we go through the whole, she takes the whole graduate program and gets a certificate in teaching in higher And she finishes, gets her PhD, and lands a great job as a professor, assistant professor of biology at a major research university, and they use IBM. So by now, I've left Johns Hopkins and I've landed at IBM. And she uses IDEA for her first class. And she selects four objectives. The first three, which are basic cognitive background, factual knowledge, theories and principles, application, and then she selects number 11, which is critical thinking. Now this class is biology for non-majors, a large class. When she gets her results back, she does pretty well in the first three, and bombs on critical thinking. And she calls me up. And she says, Shelly, help me out here. You're an idea. <laughs> Still a teacher, I guess. Help me out here. So I take her to these three questions. And I said, Amanda, is critical thinking a significant part of your course? And she said, oh, no, not really. I just think it's really important for them to be critical thinkers. So I kept on going down. And you know what happened. She answered no to every one of them. Now what happened here? Amanda is like many of us. She is passionate about student learning. And when you think about critical thinking, of course, we all want all our students to think critically. No doubt about it. And so we are inclined to say, oh, yes, 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 that's important. We need to stop and remind ourselves, the question isn't really do we just think it's important. The question is, is it important to this class? In other words, is it a target of this particular course? The most frequent mistake that faculty make with the faculty information form is selecting too many. And I understand that because I'm right there with you. I feel passionate about what I want my students to learn. And I'm just as inclined to say, oh, yes, that's important. Oh, yes, that's important. Of course that's important. But the question isn't, is it important and do you want your students to learn it? The question is, are we targeting it in class? Are you doing something specific to help your students achieve progress on it, and does it affect the grade? If you can answer yes to all three of those, you are likely to need to select it.